Hello everyone and welcome to this episode of the Go To Book Club series. Let's do uh, let's do a round of introductions. I'm Trisha G. I'm a Java champion. Um, I used to be the Java advocacy lead at JetBrains and um, doing developer advocacy for things like IntelliJ Idea. Thank you. Uh, yep, I'm Helen Scott, and I'm the current Java Advocacy Lead at JetBrains, and we're we're both hosting and guesting. I'm not sure if that's a word, uh, but we're going to be hosts and guests on this episode of the Go To Book Club series, and we are going to be talking about our book, Getting to Know IntelliJ Idea, which is available on LeanPub, and helpfully there's a so just a copy sat right on my desk here. Um, <laughs> so yeah. Um, this is this is a bit of a story. It's it was two years in the making, so there's quite a lot that we want to talk about. But I guess my first question that I want to ask Trisha. Let's start at the beginning. Why did you want to write this book in the first place, Trisha? Well, mostly I wanted to write a book. Um, I've wanted to write a book for a long time. Uh, I was involved doing research for Head First Java like absolutely ages ago, which at that time didn't really go anywhere. Um, and then 2020 came around and we weren't doing conferences anymore. And it felt like, oh, I've got loads of time on my hands. <laughs> let's, let's write a book. Um, and I, I thought about writing a book with you, Helen, because we, I'd helped to edit 97 things every Java programmer should know, um, and helped to put together a bunch of, uh, bunch of pieces for that. And I asked you, Helen, if you wanted to do that. And you're like, oh, well, I don't really have time right now. I'm not going to do it. And then afterwards you were like, Curses. I wish I'd done that. So true story. Um, the true story. And um, I mean, I wrote about this in the, in my most recent blog post about the whole history of which book we were going to write. And, and there was a bit of a backwards and forwards with we were thinking about doing a head first book and we were thinking about doing some other bits and pieces. Um, but ultimately, we, uh, you know, you and I came to this conclusion of let's do something easy, which will be quick, which we both know. Um, let's, uh, let's write something about IntelliJ IDEA and let's try and do something which is um, kind of an introduction to IntelliJ IDEA whilst also having some useful reference material for um, experienced users and, well, basically junior through mid-level all the way to up to experienced users. And, um, uh, and yeah, so that was our easy option of, of the book that we were going to write, which uh, does lead me to my to my question to you, which is, um, what motivated you to write a book with me when I when I asked you, do you want to write a book? Well, <laughs> you've already covered one of my motivators, and that is regret. Uh, you you asked me to contribute to ninety seven things every Java programmer should know, and and I didn't, and I regret that even to this day. So I thought I've let one opportunity pass me by. I'm not going to let a second opportunity go. Uh, so many reasons. I think probably the main one was I knew I, I would learn a lot. I wouldn't just learn a little bit. I would learn a lot. I mean, you have been using the product for for how long, actually? 20 years? More? No, not that long. But um, I have been, the first time I used it was 2006. Um, I've been okay. using, and I was using on and off up until 2000 and start 2009. And then I basically have used it ever yeah. since then. I knew that I could not just learn about the functionality, but learn about how you specifically use the functionality and you use it, you know, in anger. So that was a strong motivator for me because I really like learning. Um, I've always wanted to be an author. <laughs> I am an author now, which is super cool, but I'm not just a wannabe author. I'm an actual author. And I knew if I was going to go on that journey with anyone and anyone who was going to help me and us get across the line, it was going to be you. Uh, so I knew I wanted to be part of the project and I, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know it was going to take two years, but we'll, we'll come on to that. <laughs> but just your enthusiasm, you had so much enthusiasm for the project and I can still remember the conversation. It was, it wasn't a loaded conversation at the time. It was just like, oh, do you, do you want to, do you want to write this book with me? And it was only as kind of the time went on and the project went on that I started to get a better understanding of what I said yes to. But I am so glad I did. Honestly, I'm so glad I said yes, uh, because you had so many awesome ideas. You had all these. You wanted the book to be quite tutorial driven to start with, didn't you? But we kind of yeah. steered away from that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think what, what you've just said reminded me of something which I had sort of forgotten, which is. One of the things I've always tried to do with developer advocacy for IntelliJ Idea, and one of the things I wanted to do with this book, um, 
bearing in mind that I no longer actually work for JetBrains. And this is really about like me trying to express to people how I use IntelliJ IDEA, not, not, not the features like here's this button and it does this and there's these things. Right. Like the, the, the reference help documentation is very, very good for that. Um, I really wanted to have an opportunity to um, show the workflow, which is it's quite difficult, especially in book form. It's quite difficult, which is why we, I was thinking about tutorials a lot to begin with, like do this, step through this, press this button, use this keyboard shortcut um, just to give people and really try and encourage people to, to actually get their hands on the keyboard rather than just reading the book and step through and feel what it's like to code with IntelliJ IDEA. Because the, the main motivation behind that was that, like I said, I have been using IntelliJ IDEA for over 10 years. Before then, I did use Eclipse and other IDEs as well. Um, and I used IntelliJ a bit before then. Um, but only when I was pairing with other people who really knew how to use it, did I, did I really did I have that light bulb moment of, oh, this is what an IDE is for. And that's what I really wanted to put across in the book, like not just it has these features. Okay, I have to remember to do that. But like, really get people into the the workflow of how um, of of how to be thinking, what to be doing, what your fingers should be doing as you're doing a specific thing. And that's why originally I was thinking about tutorials because that kind of is going to encourage people to um, to get their hands dirty and really learn through doing. Um, the, one of the reasons we ended up moving a bit away from tutorials is that. Uh, they're very, um, oh, what's the right word? Uh, they can vary a lot with the versions of IntelliJ IDEA. So this button moves over here. The keyboard shortcuts tend not to change, but the functionality can sometimes be simplified or buttons move around a bit or, um, and I know we're going to talk about that a little bit later on in the, in the call as well, but like um, the tutorial, the step-by-step -step way does not date very well. Um, and so what, what I really wanted to do when I started thinking more about what do I want the reader to get out of it um, and what you were sort of feeding back to me when you were sort of saying, what you thought was valuable in this book was was this mindset, the IntelliJ idea mindset. Like, how should you be? What sort of mental models do you have in order to work effectively with the IDE? And tutorials were just one piece of that picture. Tutorials are like, right, get your hands dirty and start to feel the flow of it. Um, but then there are other ways to showcase, um, you know, what the IDE can do and where you should be looking when you want to achieve certain things. And I think we kind of wanted to, to pivot more towards that. How should you be thinking? Where should you be looking rather than this is a tutorial for building a Gradle project, for example. You, interesting that you say that. You just you reminded me of something else that I wanted to mention. Um, my background, for those of you uh, listeners who don't know, is very much in technical writing. So it's kind of Java technical writing back to Java. And one thing that Trisha and I definitely didn't want to do was duplicate the online help because the online help's already there and it's great and it does not need duplicating. Uh, so one phrase that we used throughout the project, and we started this quite early on, was why? Why, why, why does the reader care about this thing? Why are we even doing this thing? Uh, and that helped kind of keep us honest to our purpose. Something else that really helped and the reason I mentioned that my background is strongly in technical writing was I found it quite hard at times to pull myself out of that product documentation space. And Trisha really did a great job of, you know, very nicely guiding me and saying, well, yes, but that's in the online help. We don't need to duplicate that. And then we would come full circle of um, why? why? Why are we doing that thing? Why does the reader care? Uh, we, we were at times quite brutal with that. We were, and we threw stuff away when we couldn't come up with a why. Like the, yep. if the why was literally like, God, it just feels like a thing people should know. But because like, we want to, <laughs> yeah, because we want to, because um, you know, and if sometimes that thinking it's something they should know will lead to the why, but sometimes it's like, no, this is just literally scratching our own itch. This is not necessarily. And we, we did throw away some chapters with great. Uh, pain in our hearts. I, I wanted to follow up on something else you said about your technical writing background. Um, and so your technical writing background with your sort of experience writing reference documentation, my blogging background with doing much more uh, informal um, uh, messaging, if you like, I thought it was interesting having us two work together because you, yeah. you helped me to formalize my language for a book, which is a little bit different. I mean, I'm Technical books should be a little bit more 
mm, chatty than a lot of technical books can be, but um, not necessarily quite as snarky as we wanted to make the book. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think we constantly had a, a good tension between you wanting to sort of, I'm not gonna, I was going to use the word sanitize the language, like formalize the language, and, and me trying to drag you a little bit away from that technical writing reference documentation. It's okay to, to have opinions. Um, and it's okay to express ourselves as human beings, um, which actually coincidentally does lead me on to my next question, which is um, how did we come up with the, the Helen Hints and Treasure Tips elements that we added into the book? I remember this conversation. This was such a cool conversation. Um, so I want to say it was quite early on in the book. And one thing that I'd been encouraging you to do, Trisha, was get your knowledge and your experience in this book where there was something that was really helpful and, and wasn't obvious, you know, to, to most developers using it. Might not be obvious, might just be a little bit out to one side, but Trisha, you'd used it and it saved you a lot of pain or, or whatever it had done. And I wanted a way to surface that experience and that knowledge in the book without it being, you know, hidden in the general flow of the book. So Trisha tips were born, this element that we have Trisha tips, which is where if it's something that generally intermediate, more advanced users of IntelliJ IDEA might benefit from, then we called it uh, a Trisha tip. So when you see one of those as you're going through the book, you know, you know that Trisha is calling on her extensive experience with the tool and with the language and you know, has some golden information to share. And then as we got more and more of these Trisha tips through the book, um, it, you actually reflected back to me, Trisha, that it was starting to feel a little bit one-sided and what, what could we do about that? I didn't want it to be my book with all of my crap in it, you know? Um, <laughs> I collaborated with you not as a ghostwriter, but as someone with your own experience to bring to the book. And it just felt really right to have Helen's tips. And then we were like, wait a minute. That doesn't work though, does it? Um, I'm not sure if a glass of wine was involved in coming up with Helen's hints, but you know, it's a nice bit of alliteration. And you know, Helen's hints were born and then that felt a lot more natural. I think it's fair to say it felt more natural to both of us that it, it also helped solve, well, <laughs> solve is a bold word. It also helped address something that we were both keen to do and that we wanted the book to appeal to all developers who might use or are using IntelliJ IDEA, regardless of experience. You know, we really wanted to take developers who've never opened the tool before, and then developers who've maybe been using it a few years. But there's, you know, with any enterprise tool, there's always going to be parts that you haven't fully investigated because we don't have time. It was a challenge. we don't have a process. Oh, yeah. Uh, given how much, given how old the tool is, like, I'm sorry, uh, mature the tool is, not old. Um, given how mature IntelliJ is and how many users there are, it's a challenge to, to, to pick the target audience. And yeah, Helen's Hints and Trisha Tips was quite a nice way to to signpost because what we wanted really was to signpost stuff throughout the book and make it easy to skim if necessary. Yep. Yeah. And I think I think they do that because generally the Helen's Hints are more aimed at users who perhaps are newer to IntelliJ IDEA or even newer to Java or might be going, yeah, but what does that setting actually do for me? Um, whereas yours, um, your Trisha tips definitely call on, you know, your extensive experience. And I've used this in anger. Be aware of this. Yeah. Uh, it was a nice place to be because otherwise the text would have been, I would have had loads of things in brackets as I just put in my opinion halfway through every single step. It was a nice way to be able to say, yeah, we've just given you three different keyboard shortcuts. Um, let me tell you my preference and why it's my preference, for example. Exactly. The, the expressing opinions and yeah, <laughs> that makes me smile with you saying the brackets and the tension that we had between me wanting to sanitize the writing and you wanting to get all your opinions in there because I took out a lot of brackets. You did take out a lot of brackets. When I wrote my last blog post, which I, well, I've written two blog posts on the book. One isn't published yet. I was like, I'm putting brackets in here and I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant. Um, but yeah, Trisha tips, Helen's hints. Um, I think we're both pleased with how those elements turned out and they, they came about at the right time and hopefully convey different types of information to different users. At least that was our goal. I think the other thing for me that became quite apparent as we were going through the book was we both, I mean, we both enjoyed writing the whole book, easy to say, but equally there were different parts that we enjoyed more 
I think it's fair to say there were some chapters that maybe I found were quite challenging or you found were a bit of a slog. And then there were other chapters who were like, right, let's go, let's do this. Um, what what do you think or what chapters would, did you enjoy the most, Tricia? I started with the tutorials because they were the easiest. And once we'd identified the things, the sort of really basic level stuff we wanted to cover, um, the tutorials were easier to write because I knew what, what I wanted to put in there, although I did second guess myself a lot of times about doing a bit of test-driven development in there. Um, but, the, but on the other hand, they're more time consuming because you have to step through and get them right and put the screenshots. So later on, I want to move to part four. And part four is, um, uh, for those who have not read the book, part four is more like, let's take a, a, a feature, if you like, a feature of the IDE, and let's explode it a little bit. Um, once we started getting into part four, originally that was quite difficult because this is basically the reference part of the book, which was where we ended up in that tension between, you know, the online help already covers some of this stuff, but it doesn't really tell you, like you said, why you want to use this feature or, or what it's for or how it helps you. Um, and, and getting our angle into the chapters in part four to begin with, like run configurations is the one I really remember because I was like, People need to understand run configurations. 90% of the time you don't use them, but for the 10% of the time when you do use them, you're completely lost if you don't have some sort of very basic understanding of what a run configuration is and why you need it, where it is and what you do with it. Um, and I didn't want to just take the run configurations dialogue and, and annotate it because, I mean, you could do that, but that didn't feel very, didn't feel very us to explain it that way. And we did do that, that at one point, didn't we? we? And then we threw it away. It's what we yeah. started with. And we threw away that bit right at the very end, like in the last two months, we threw away that. Yeah. Um, but uh, that was what I, that's what I thought we were going to do with part four is we'd take an area of the IDE, annotate it, and that would give us a chance to kind of explain how and why. Um, but it, it didn't really work as well as I hoped it would do. And with the run configurations, what I ended up doing is like, asking why what what do you want to do with the run configurations dialogue and the answer is how do i pass in arguments to my application how do i set environment variables how do i um how do i have more than one run configure why would i need more than one run configuration how do i have the run, share the run configurations with my team once you start asking those questions of what do you use this for why is it helpful um and then that's how we ended up coming up with the frequently asked questions format in in part four um, and that suddenly became, that was like a light bulb moment of, ah, this is how we can get the, 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 the important parts of the, of the IDE across to the reader without having to explain every single stupid button, you know, because half the buttons, you know, you could, we could even say, in fact, we did say in some places, just ignore these bits. Like if you need them, the help documentation points out what they're for, or there's a blog post somewhere else. And that was another thing we did quite a lot of, um, we don't want to repeat ourselves a lot. So if something already existed somewhere else, we'd be like, Go over here and read about it somewhere else. We're not we're not going to cover that because it's already been done. But doing the frequently asked questions thing really was a great focus for me to to be like, what do I use this for? When do I use this? And I'm sure we've we've missed some use cases. I'm sure there's a bunch of stuff that you know we have not covered. But it was a nice way of of getting the sort of hitting the eighty twenty rule, um, except that it's sort of the opposite. It's like you know, most people only use about 5% of the features. Like how do we cover the 5% of the features for the 80% of the use cases that you're going to be using them for? Um, so I haven't picked a specific chapter. I'll probably run configurations is probably one of my favorite chapters in the end because I really struggled to get into it. And then once I got there, I'm like, right, I really get why I'm writing about this. And I really, I think that this has not been done in this way before. And I think it will really help users of IntelliJ IDEA to, to understand how how and why to use run configurations. I can remember all the iterations of run configurations and all the, ah, we've got to do this chapter again conversations. Oh. And on, on the topic of chapters that we had to do again, surprisingly, the chapters that cover features that I use the most, especially use in live demos the most, were the most difficult ones. So live templates, live templates, inspections and intentions. Um, I, I made you do those. I was like, I don't want to do them. Um, and then, uh, and then we both ended up iterating over those chapters, like at least twice each, didn't we? Cause yeah. And again, we, 
we went back to why 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 should why should the reader care about what an inspection is why should they care about what an intention is and in the end we separated the chapters out to be aligned to the use case rather than the feature which right, i think we're very pleased we, with. we don't even have an inspections and inten- inspections and intentions no. chapter anymore do we we have errors and no. warnings um and refactoring your code which yes. it's just so much better and i just can't believe we didn't think about that to begin with well, again, a last minute change, really, where we're, we're like, why is inspections and intentions not working? Because nobody is thinking about inspections and intentions. Yeah. They're thinking about errors and warnings and changing their code. Yep. So, yeah. So uh, for me, the stuff in part four was actually most satisfying to to write because it felt like that's where we were doing the job of, um, of really getting the information across, um, which... It leads me on to my next question, which is like, and we've touched a little bit on this with the Helen's hints and, and Trisha tips. Like, one of the challenges we had was trying to address this range of users that we have. We knew our primary audience really is people who are new to the IDE or not new to programming necessarily, because sometimes you can't you enter into a new team and they're using a different IDE. And so, you know, we were thinking about these different types of users: new, new-ish to programming, new-ish to the IDE, but also experienced users who know that there's probably some gaps in their knowledge or maybe just want to cement their knowledge or figure out how to do a specific thing. Like, how how do you think, Helen, people can use our book um, given they've got different levels of experiences? I think this is something that we tried to address with the various elements, but to give a little bit more detail, if, if you're new to IntelliJ IDEA or you've not been using it for for a long time, obviously that is subjective, but let's say one to two years. I think reading the book from front to back could be really helpful for you. You will absolutely learn stuff. You will categorically learn stuff um, about the ID that will, you know, improve your your day to day job. Because we didn't write the book to make the IDE shine so much as we wrote the book to help you to shine, because that's what it's all about. So there's reading front to back. There's dipping in and out as well. Uh, this can be for for any users. You might just and you might be that kind of person that doesn't really read technical books from front to back. I mean, there's lots of us out there. We tend to just go, oh, I want to learn about that and go in there and skip to that page. Part four as well that Trish has spoken about. <laughs> Part four has had such a journey. Uh, it it was not supposed to be so big to start with. But as we went through it, we realized that there was a use case for it. Because as you get more experience with the IDE, you are more familiar with the names of some of the pieces of functionality. So for example, uh, local history or um, clipboard history, I'm on all the histories today, Uh, built or window, there might be stuff in there that you're like, I just want to learn how to use this feature better. And then you can scan through part four and you can go, okay, today, this Friday afternoon, I'm just going to pick that chapter because I really, I know my knowledge around build tools is not quite where I want it to be. So I'm going to have a read of this and get some more information. And that will help me in the future to to learn more about that specific thing. Actually, so, uh, to interject to this point, like build tools is a good example because build tools, um, debugging, version control we did those but we did all of them twice in the book we at did, least like and we did an introductory level in parts two or three and then we did a deeper dive in in part four um yes it's very much split up so that you can be like here's the high level stuff you're going to use every day and then here's the more detailed um stuff with some maybe some niche things that you might want to know about that's um that's a great example actually, and just to build on that, um, I think it's something that you did specifically very well, Trisha. When you introduced the notion of um, you introduced the notion of things like build tools and debugging very very early on in the early tutorials even, and then we layered that knowledge. However, that doesn't mean that if you know you've been using IntelliJ IDEA for a period of time and you jump into part four, you'll miss out because. All the code we've we've linked back. All the code is available for you on GitHub if you do want to take a look at it. And we haven't made any assumptions that you've read earlier parts of the book. We might have referenced, look, we did this earlier on. If you want to go back and take a look, but we haven't then gone and created content that absolutely relies on you going through a very specific 
set of steps. We've just said, look, here's the code at that snapshot in time, off you go. And I, I think that's a really nice way of supporting users to read the book how, however they want to go through it. Yeah, I think I, it was nice for me to be able to have to put code on GitHub. There's obviously this code in the book, but the code in books is not very helpful because you have to type it all out. So having it on GitHub is nice because we could, like you say, people can just download it and dive straight into the middle. They don't have to follow the tutorials right from the beginning. They've got example projects and they can see how it should look in their IDE based on what's in the book and what's in GitHub. Question that I have for you, Tricia. Uh, given your extensive experience um, in the industry and with the tool, what did you learn about the IDE writing this book? I actually learned quite a lot about run configurations <laughs> since we talked about that. Um, I realized there are some things that I do uh, through sort of cargo cultism, if you like, like just like just following a certain set of steps because it works and you've just always done it that way. Run configurations is kind of one of those things where I'm like, I don't really have a good mental model of what's going on here. So I actually, I had to do a bunch of research really on what, what it was really doing and how it's supposed to work. Um, I did learn a lot about the, the way dependency management has changed inside IntelliJ IDEA. And this is one of those weird things where I've done complete like 180 because when I saw that there was a, a new dependencies window um, and it uses um, package search from JetBrains and it, it works in a very different way, I was like, I don't need none of that. Like I know how to do my stuff. I can do stuff with generate code and with code completion. And I know how the, the Maven repository scanning works in the way that, and I, I'm, I'd written all of that. I documented all of that. Um, and then as I got to learn how dependency management works um, in the new world order, I was like, oh, this is, this is better. <laughs> I don't have to write 600 different ways of doing it. It just works the same way every single time. And, um, and it, it really, I, I changed my workflow based on that. So, um, those are the two main things I think that I, that I learned. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. I also did a bunch of research on version control. The version control part of the book, this is an early print. But part four, by the way, is like more than 50% of the of the Yeah, it book. is. And the version control thing, I think, was 30 pages. <laughs> and I was like, how do I get this to the absolute bare minimum? Um, and, uh, yeah, it was about 30 pages of, of what's a merge versus a rebase in and why does it look different in IntelliJ IDEA? So yeah, there was a there's a bunch of stuff there that I learned. Obviously, there's a whole lot of stuff I learned in terms of um, like writing the book, creating the book, ASCII Doctor, ASCII Doctor support in IntelliJ IDEA, which is freaking amazing. Um, the, the we were using a build pipeline from from Josh Long, which uses Spring Boot and Spring Batch and a bunch of other stuff there. Um, I didn't know how GitHub Actions worked before we built the book. I learned a lot of technical stuff while we were writing the book. Um, there was a lot of um, GitHub Actions in particular using using those things. I had no idea how any of that stuff worked. Um, and so technically, I probably learned more in this last year writing a book than, than I have done in some projects where I've been writing code. <laughs> What about you? What did um, what what did you learn about IntelliJ IDEA while you were writing the book? How long have we got? <laughs> um, Actually, not that long. <laughs> before I answer that question, I, I want to mention something that perhaps we should have said at the start in that we used IntelliJ IDEA to write this book, as Trisha just alluded to. Um, what did I learn? Um, I learned so much, honestly. I, I It's a flippant comment to say, how long have we got? But... I, I'm struggling to kind of pull out the bits that I thought I learned the most about. Deep, if I had to, it would probably be debugging. Um, I didn't have, I didn't realize just how much support IntelliJ Ideas debugger can give you. And now when I'm asked about it um, at conferences or wherever, my advice is always learn the debugger before you need it. Because when you've got a bug or you've got support like banging on your door or, or whatever it is, you really want to have the tools to understand what your code is doing, why your code is doing that thing or not doing that thing, as the case may be, before you need it in anger. And I was, when Trisha started going through the different kinds of breakpoints and the watchpoints and all the different ways that you can manipulate 
your code at, you know, when it's running, I was, I was quite genuinely blown away by that. Um, build tools as well. Uh, there's just so much, there is so much. I was like, oh, that's really cool. Um, I think as well, there were, it goes back to the Trisha tips. It's not just about the functionality. It's also about how you have used the functionality in anger. That for me, was a really interesting, um, interesting thing to note. And like, like I've just said, you know, we wrote the book in IntelliJ Idea. We were using code with me. It was, I think it was still an EAP actually when we first started using it. I think when we first, when I was doing my, my blog post on the history, I think when we first started writing, we didn't have code with me. I think we were doing screen sharing and we were doing like stand ups right. and going away and doing our own thing. I think code with me came in after a few months and we were yeah. using a really early access internal to JetBrains. That's right. That's right. Um, and of course, you know, we wrote a book about a product, a product that is released three times a year. It's a massive enterprise product with lots of developers working on it. Uh, it's, it's in a constant stage of flux, which is awesome because it's constantly improving. But that did mean that we were, we were working with a moving target. Um, and there were some pretty major changes throughout that, weren't there? Yeah. I mean, I, I've already mentioned that uh, dependencies changed. I had to throw away um not quite a whole chapter but two or three big chunks of work that i did i'd done right at the beginning back in 2020 and i threw them away in summer with all the pain in my heart i was like this still works but it's not the way i would recommend people to do it anymore because the new dependency stuff is so much faster and so much easier and it's not before there was three or four different ways of doing stuff. And it's like, oh, pick this if you like this or pick this, you know, and, and with the new dependencies window, it's just the same workflow all the way through. So that was, um, yeah, the fact that that changed underneath us, like when we first started writing the, the book, I think that I did check it. I put it in the book. The, the dependencies window came in, I'm going to say 2021. Um, we probably had access to it a bit earlier, but I wouldn't have been using it early on. Um, but it was a big enough change that it was worth throwing away stuff that I knew really well, stuff that we documented very early on um, to document a new feature that's, I'm not going to say it's not stable. It's, it's not, it is stable, but they'll still be evolving it from here on outwards, which is, it, that's challenging too, because we've, we've documented this workflow and, the, and obviously the screenshots and the way it looks, and it will definitely change because it's still very much in progress. Um, so that that was a challenge. Um, the the other challenge that we were racing against the clock to get the book out before 2022.3 because we'd done all the screenshots in 2022.2 and I was not going to redo them all, all over again. Um, and also because um, we knew that there's this new UI coming for IntelliJ Idea 2. Um, and Knowing what I know about how IntelliJ Idea works when new features come in, particularly new, very visible features like the UI, there will be a lot of users who will continue using the, the old UI for a long time and you can keep it on the old UI. So, um, not too, I'm not too worried about how dated the, the screenshots will get for the, for the user interface, but I definitely didn't want us to release the book after a brand new UI went live, because that would just be really, really frustrating. So yeah, the, the product changing, like the new release, the product coming out three times a year, it was it was a race. I and mean, one of the reasons that, that we worked so hard on it over summer was to get it out before the next release um, and to try and keep up with it. However, I think it also offers some really interesting um, opportunities um, because we can continue evolving the book going forward or write supplemental material. Um, we're definitely keen on like big changes that come out that impact everyone. We're definitely keen on doing more stuff uh, for that going forward, even if it's just, you know, God, I hope it's only just like a one sheet reference of here's the new UI. <laughs> Easy piece. It just, won't be. I know it won't be. <laughs> because the screenshots took me like two months and I'm going to have to do them all over again. Um, but it also validated our original approach of we know the product is going to change. We really need to focus on what I called the IntelliJ idea mindset. And I think we actually removed that from the book in the end. But still, I still think of it as the mindset of IntelliJ idea. The guiding principles. The guiding principles, like guiding principles. really getting us to focus on the things that aren't going to change. For example, use refactoring tools. Don't do stuff manually. I mean, IntelliJ actually makes it easy. If you do do stuff manually these days, it still says you should probably refactor yeah. this. But, you know. Yeah. The 
assume that IntelliJ can keep your code compiling at all times. Don't try and break it and fix stuff up because yes, you can do that, but you're really not getting the most out, out of your IDE. Um, you know, all of these sorts of things, try and get people, try and give the idea in the book of the stuff that's not necessarily going to change. Um, the buttons might change, the icons might change, um, but the yeah. underlying principles of, you know, keep your code green, um, use the keyboard where you can, and tell me what the other principle was because I can't remember it. Always green, keyboard first, in the flow, see? Because in the flow is so difficult to actually document. Um, but yeah, trying to keep that idea that in the flow thing of being so key and so difficult to talk about because it's so intangible. When you're working with IntelliJ ID, you should be assuming there's a way for it to do stuff so that you don't have to break your concentration. Um, and no amount of changing the color of the buttons is going to change that for IntelliJ ID. It's no. always going to be about staying in the flow. Integrated. Yes. Oh, yeah. Integrated. Everything is worth the ID. Actually, um, this wasn't on our script of things to talk about either. But um, the fact that we, we talked um, a bit in the book about how an integrated development environment, the integration bit is important. And we, we covered that what we tried to cover that with the stuff you were just talking about teaching debugging early teaching build tools early in the book because it's not about write hello world and run it it's about when you're writing a real application you will always be integrating with all these other different bits and pieces you won't necessarily be writing code and then the next day debugging and then the next day doing build tool stuff you're constantly flipping between these different bits and pieces that you need to do and the fact that IntelliJ ID is an integrated environment um, helps you to stay in the flow and not not interrupt yourself. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So then my my question about challenges for you is that given this is your first book, what was the hardest thing about the whole book writing project? Mm, I think I think maybe I had some unrealistic expectations. When I say maybe, I mean, I definitely had some unrealistic expectations. I did at times struggle with motivation. I did not expect it to take two years. Uh, I did not expect uh, a long break for you to work on Head First Java. I'm super glad you did. Very happy for you. Very awesome. Um, I think getting started after that was a bit of a, come on, let's just get it over the line. Um, but you know what? I learned so much and I learned a lot about me as a person. Um, I learned a lot about how I work. I learned a lot about how you work. I learned a lot about how we work together. And I'm trying to think, would I do it all again? And I, I, I think, I think I would, but maybe it's too soon to mention that. Um, you, you alluded to this earlier, actually, something else that we, we both learned a lot about, but I think you took the, the brunt of was, uh, the self publishing aspects. And like I say, we're using this pipeline from Josh Long and, uh, what would you say have you kind of learned the most or, or what would you say are the pros and cons of, of that self-publishing journey? I think I mean, one of the reasons we chose to self-publish, apart from the fact that the, the royalty percentage is much more generous, is that I thought, <laughs> again, coming back to your point about unrealistic expectations and naivety, and you've got to bear in mind that that I have worked on, on two books with O'Reilly before. Um, I thought... Given what we've done before with blog posts, given your experience with writing, given my experience with Head First Java, where I had to control a lot of the way the book looks because Head First Java is very much like you use InDesign and you have to draw it all yourself. And, and so you do a lot of it yourself. You don't, you don't use the publishers for, for resizing screenshots and stuff like that. I thought, well, it's not, it's not that hard. <laughs> like all I have to do is, yes, I mean, even if you use a publisher, you're gonna have to take the screenshots anyway. You have to put them in a particular resolution properly. They'll do a bunch of layout and formatting and, and, and typesetting and, and proofreading. Um, and that is, you know, it's nice that they do that. Um, but I thought, you know, I'm not sure I wanna sacrifice so much of our royalties towards a publisher just for that. Um, but I think in retrospect, there are certain things where I think there's going to be certain types of books where a publisher just makes things a lot easier. Um, yeah. because you just, I mean, when we were, when we were doing the proofreading, for example, which I think in retrospect, I think we did the proofreading a little bit early because we made quite a lot of changes after the proofreading stage. Yeah. Um, I, I think it, it's nice to have someone else do that for you and you don't have to do it yourself. Um, it's nice to have someone worry about page breaks and layout. Um, and we don't even have a lot of control over that because of, because you know we're using ASCII doc and we're we're generating a PDF. 
Um, we don't have as much control over that as we would like anyway. Um, so there's a lot of challenges and, and keeping the keeping the pipeline up and running. Every month, GitHub Action is telling us we're nearly out of three oh, minutes. Every um, month. Every month. Um, and then, yeah, and I think it was the right decision for this book. I think, like you say, I think we learned a lot. One of the unexpectedly good side effects of self-publishing for this book is once we had decided we were finished, we just hit publish. It was, it was out there. It was Sunday evening, done. It was Sunday evening. My dad was coming to see me on Monday and I'm like, it's got to be done before dad comes because I'm not spending any more time on the book. Um, and you just hit publish and it's out there. And, and I mean, the great thing about publishers is that you give them the book and then they sort everything out and they make it pretty and they publish it. But like Head First Java, I finished the majority of the work on that, I think, early February and I didn't get a physical copy of the book till June. And that's, you know, it's a long time to wait for that feeling of gratification, you know. <laughs> And with the book, with this book, because we're sort of fighting these product release deadlines, it was really important that we could just just publish the book as soon as it was ready before 2022.3 came out. Um, we have a lot of control over if we want to update the screenshots, we can just update the screenshots and publish a new version. Um, and there's a lot less of a lead time between us making changes and it getting into the hands of the readers. And I actually think that's probably the main advantage for us right now. So you're already talking yourself into updating the screenshots there? Well, we have to really, don't we? Because the new we UI do. is actually really cool. And I, I think it's going to look really nice in the book. It is. I completely agree. I think that's all we wanted to cover, really. Or, I mean, we had lots to cover and there's loads more that we could say. But I think the, the final thing to really say is please buy our book. Um, uh, I wrote a blog post on the history of writing the book, including why it took two years to do, uh, which you should be able to find at trishadee.com slash blog. Um, Helen wrote a much better blog post about what's actually in the book and how it's laid out. Yep. Uh, so you can find my blog over on my website, which is helenjoscott.com. So in the, if you're wondering kind of what's in the book before you buy it, this is the blog post to look at because I've got screenshots in there. Some screenshots of the guided tutorials, the, the Trisha tips and the Helen's hints that we've spoken about, the chapter summaries. It'll give you a really good overview of kind of how the book is structured and what's in there. Um, and like Trisha says, uh, doesn't matter whether you've been using IntelliJ Idea for for, for years or any number of years, or if you've not used the product, the goal of the book was to help or is to help you be awesome. Uh, so whatever, whatever your experience and your journey, I'm confident that you will learn something from it. Uh, talking of which, we should, we should tell people where to find the book, right? Yes, I was just thinking that. You can go to leanpub.com um, and search for Getting to Know IntelliJ Idea. Uh, hopefully it might be on the homepage because it sometimes makes it into the top 10 of the homepage. But if not, getting to know IntelliJ Idea um, and you, you, can, you can find it there and you can buy it from there. And like Helen says, our goal really is no matter what stage in your journey you are, there should be something in there for you if you, if you either use IntelliJ Idea or have vaguely thought about getting started with it. Yeah. Thank you, Helen, for talking to me, as usual, like we don't talk to each other every day. <laughs> this is like, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Trisha. Uh, pleasure, as always, to, to chat and, and to do it in, in this forum. Well, it's been wonderful. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Subscribe to the GoTo YouTube channel now and join the experts in person or online at any upcoming GoTo conference using the promo code BOOKCLUB. Visit gotopia.tech to learn more.